Hello and welcome to the Booktopia podcast. My name is Mark Harding and today I am joined by a very well-loved Australian. He's given over three million meals to the poor and homeless. He's helped thousands of underprivileged He's been named as a national living treasure and one of the people in Australia and he's here with us today at Booktopia. Lidcom to talk about his new book, 12 Rules for Living a Better Life. The Reverend Bill Cruz, welcome to Booktopia. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for asking me. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, now, the first question that I had um, was actually about the forward that, that you received for this book, which unfortunately isn't included in this edition, yeah. but we're going to have it up on our website. But you received a forward from the Dalai Lama, who yeah. you have known for many years. Yeah. What's that conversation like when you're approaching the Dalai Lama to ask for a forward for your book? I just sent him an email. <laughs> he, his mate, the person who looks after him is a guy called Chimmy. So I just emailed Chimmy and I said, would his holiness... And bang, came back. And uh, I, I assume um, that your publisher was very excited about that as well. Oh, well, I was. Yeah. I was really moved by that, really moved. Because he's living in that in Dharamsala, and every day his people have such a hard time, mm. and to take time to do that is something I'm really grateful for. Now you're here with twelve rules for living a better life. Who do you hope will be the readers of this book, and what do you hope that um, they'll get out of it? Probably me when I was younger. And I hope it says to people, you don't have to be stuck where you are. Mm -hmm. um, there's always a way forward, always. And in a way, I didn't know that. And I was, I've, I've had, so I was able to um, uh, realise there are a lot of people who feel they're stuck and they don't have to be. Mm. Why do you think people are so engaged with a search for meaning? And have you seen shifts in the conversations that you've been having with people over the past year with the impact of COVID and all the repercussions that that's had on, on people's lives? Yes and no. <laughs> I think um, everybody wonders where we come from and where we're going when we die, all of that sort of stuff. And... But everyone kind of gets tired of banging their thumb with the hammer time after time <laughs> after time and suddenly realise, how do I stop banging my thumb, you know? And I'm, all I'm doing is hurting myself. How do I get out of this? And that's really what a lot of it's about. How do I get out of it? How do I move forward? Mm. And do you think that um, – uh, sorry, let me start that again – uh, so 12 Rules for Living a Better Life is also a memoir. Uh, you share stories of your family, your work, your life and your experiences. And it's really clear that you've seen and experienced a lot from deep personal tragedy to being confronted with hypocrisy and failings of the church authority to seeing incredible moments of grace and charity. When you're exploring all this as you're writing this book, um, was this a cathartic experience for you? No. <laughs> No, it was very painful, mm. very painful because I was mixing up, I was kind of getting, putting all my life together. So it's a mixture of personal and, and other people and stories. And it really, so it, it made me look at my own life. And I'd, I'd never, I wouldn't have been able to do this a few years ago because you know, the pain still keeps happening, you know. So, um, no, it's, it's, it was cathartic in lots of ways. And in lots of ways, um, I finished writing it, what, several, many months ago, and my life has changed since then anyway. So I look back at that and I think, oh, that's what I was thinking then, you know. So that um, it's a mixture of pain... Look, everybody's got a story. Everybody's life is a story. And mine is a story just like anybody else's. So I mix mine in with everybody else's. Mm. And that's very hard to do because you think 
it's your own story and it's different, but it ain't. <laughs> How long did it take you to write the book? All in, all about a year. But in parts of it, I've been writing it for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think um, what you were mentioning before about how you feel you've changed since you finished writing the book, and I think change is kind of a, a recurring theme in the book as well. Yeah. Did you change? Is the person who, st- who started writing the book a different person to the person who finished very it? Very much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Very, very much. And um, oh, in some ways it's still the same, <laughs> but... I'm gradually, I am learning my own rules, if you know yeah. what I mean. You don't learn your rules until you live them. Yeah. And realising my story is everybody's story in a different story form, you know. Yeah. You mentioned before, uh, when, uh, before we came into the studio, that um, there were 25 rules, I believe you yeah. said, and it's been whittled down to, down to 12. 12. Um, what was that process uh, like? Well, someone else did that. Oh, someone else did that. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, it, because of my involvement with the 12-step movement a lot as well, um, it just seemed more sensible. And probably some of the rules could be squashed into one anyway. Um, and had you been planning to write this for a while? Has it been gestating um, prior to, no. to... I'd been. I'd think about it and then I'd think, oh, I can't write about that or I'm so ashamed of that, or mm. anything like that. So that, no, I'd, I'd, it was tempting, but it was too hard, mm. too hard. Mm. So it took, it took a lot of struggling to let it all out. Mm. We talk to a lot of people who come through and have written memoirs and uh, – Obviously, one of the key things with writing a work of memoir is that you're talking about people who are involved in your life, who are, who are still alive, um, and that can also be quite a tricky experience to negotiate. How to write it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because I can be blazingly honest, right? But uh, do I have the right to be blazingly honest in a way that damages somebody else, you mm. know? and. One of my rules, I don't think it's in this one, is do no damage, you know, mm-hmm. because that's a big one, a big one. And, and um, so I've had to learn the difference between being honest in different ways with different people who are in front of you. Mm. So it sounds like if, uh, if this book is, a, is the runaway success that we all hope it is, there could be 12 more rules for <laughs> living a better life. Yeah, there could be a lot more stories. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. But also it's pushing the edges so that um, those stories I don't want to tell come closer to being told. Mm. This book is bookended by stories of your visits to the jungle, the infamous oh, yeah. refugee camp in Calais. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience, what you found there and why it made you determine to live your life in a different way? Well, it actually began with a woman ringing me up to say would I um, show a film which was about the 12-step movement. And um, then I had, I had a day left in London because I do stuff there and um, I thought I'm not going to waste this day and ended up in Calais look with the refugees. And, like, there are two... There are many events in my life, but there are two pinnacle events. One was on the stairs of the Wayside Chapel and the other one was this one mm. when um, um, you just go there and you're in a refugee camp and, oh, God, there can't be anything worse. It's just awful, awful, awful. And... You, you're really part of really suffering and you then see how inhuman people can be to one another and everybody's just the person, you know. And um, one guy said, he was Middle Eastern and he said, you know, I've got a photo of him um, 
when I die, take my body back to Palestine because I won't be a refugee no more. And anyway, so you just... See, and we, we were spending a lot of time trying to get this little kid in the hospital because she was really sick and could die. And um, the French authorities wouldn't take her because she didn't have papers. And I thought, God, this is a kid. You mm. don't do those things. Anyway, so it was like that. And I saw a sign which said NA meeting and I thought, I'll go to that. Like I'm not, I've never been addicted or anything, but that 12-step movement, I thought, I'll see. And sitting in a carpet, bit of carpet, were 20 people, men and women, telling their story. And I didn't understand any of the languages. There was every race on earth there telling their story. Every refugee on earth, Muslim, all Muslim. And it got to me and I thought, what, what am I going to say? And um, I said, all I could get out was I'm built from Australia. And they said English. And I said, no, mm. I can't get you to England. And then my whole life poured out. Mm. And I told, oh, I'm getting upset, I told all those people my life. Mm. And they honoured it. Mm -hmm. They had nothing. These people who had nothing honoured my life and they got up and they gave me a hug and made me part of them and in a funny way they gave me my life back and I thought I can never thank these people enough. Just so I went back to London and I thought I've got to do my thanks so I threw out all my clothes and I just wear black now. Mm. because I want people to see I'm different. Mm. It's incredibly powerful, um, that moment, and I think it really um, encapsulates uh, a lot of the themes uh, that you write about in the book. Um, you know, these horrific situations, but these incredibly touching, moving moments that come out of it. Yeah, yeah, and these touching moments happen every day, everywhere. Mm. It's only in the blackest of places where they stand out mm. that you realise um, uh, it's everywhere, mm. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, I wanted to explore the rules a little bit as well, um, and I thought we could just touch very quickly on, on each of them without yeah. you know, kind yeah. of giving away too much of the book. <clears throat> Um, but rule number one, uh, you talk about cultivating lovingness and compassion. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Um, the Buddha says a broken heart is a beautiful thing. I've found um, life can either break you or break you open. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be broken open. And what happens is because you've suffered, you understand other suffering and you, you, it's a learning process but you learn to walk beside others while they're suffering mm. so that um, um, and the more you do that, the more you get back. So the more you cultivate it, the more it grows and the more it spreads out around you. Mm. Rule number two, trust in a higher power, just trust. Yeah. And you start um, explaining this rule in the book by talking about how people assume that your uh, belief in a higher power is easy because you're a reverend. Um, but you say that it's, it's actually difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. Because we don't trust. <laughs> we don't trust. When, when I, um, it's often when you look back because I thought I'm off to Calais, you know, and I got... I got on the ferry across to Dover and uh, from Dover across to Calais and I suddenly realised I left all my money behind. I only had 30 euros in my passport. <laughs> mm. <laughs> France with me. And I go up to the taxi and I say, can you take me to the jungle? And he says, no, but I'll take you halfway. And it was 15 euros. So I had enough money to go to the jungle and come back. Um, just trust. Mm. If you trust, things happen. 
Mm. If you don't trust and you think, oh, I'm not going to do that. Like I have this big argument all the time about welfare like that, that all the agencies and things, they want to do kind of test the thing and, uh, you know, go out and do this and do that, have A and B and C, which watch works and things. And I just go out and do it. And it's trusting. Mm. And you find the most amazing things happen when you trust like that. Mm. But it's a hard thing to do because our cautiousness tends to make us not want to trust. Mm. And I, I liked uh, what you said in the book as well um, about people who might, you know, criticize um, giving out of free meals that, you know, maybe people who are coming up to get them don't, don't, don't deserve them. And, you know, your stance that even if one person who came and received it deserved it, oh. then it was all worth it. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's the whole point, you see. The not trusters would charge everybody and that person who really needed it wouldn't get it. Yep. yep. Uh, so rule number three, um, a tree will grow in fertile soil, sandy soil will stunt it. It is true for human beings too. We need to find the right company. Yep. And in this one, you precede this, this rule uh, with stories about um, things that you witnessed uh, in King's Cross. Yeah, because... King's Cross could be a really um, sandy soil environment <laughs> um, and you'd see people change because of it. And it's also um, um, life needs to be a series of hellos and goodbyes mm -hmm. and often we tend to not want to say goodbye to in a way, the people who aren't good for us. Mm -hmm. And yet um, what I found was um, two of the biggest moments in my life have been when people have said goodbye to the environment I'm, I'm in and I'm heading off to a new environment where I can begin to grow. Mm -hmm. Like you, you could see it, say, with um, people coming out of jail, that they just get booted out often just with a pair of shorts and a plastic bag, they get booted out and they have nowhere to go but the environment they went to. Mm. So that it's inevitable. The same thing creates the same thing. Whereas move into a new environment and you can actually change. Because what we are the reflection we see in the eyes of the other. Mm -hmm. So if we're surrounded by a circle of crooks, hard not to be a crook too. <laughs> mm. uh, rule number four, find a help group to share your growth journey with. Yeah. Yeah. Who would that be for you? It's, I'm, I'm right in the middle of one because the books come out and whatever, mm. I'm right in the middle now. It's, it's hard to find people like that. Um, you, you need people who are kind of at your level and you can share your innermost soul with because that's how you discover yourself, because we're continually changing and it's the people that we're with that enable us to change and it's the freeing ourselves of our, our, our guilts that enable us to grow. And the only way we can do that is by telling our stories and sharing mm. and people forget that. They, they forget and you need a group of people who will extend you as well because people say, oh, I can do that in my family or I can do it with my extended family. And like, you can in a way but they put you in a box anyway mm. and you need, you need to be able to step out of that box so you can find yourself. Mm. Rule number five, mentor others. Yeah. With that, with that moves what you've learned from your head to your heart and helps others too. I found that often talking with um, some of my kids that I'll find myself saying things and saying to them and thinking, hey, that's true. I'd better do that for myself, mm -hmm. you know. And then they go and talk to someone and then they'll come back and say, look, this, you know, and you, you suddenly find it's you have to do it. Mm. You have to do it. That's the mentoring. Mm. And, and that's, a, that's a nice um, segue to the next rule, which is one that I really, really love, which is do who you are. Life is 
a doing as well as a navel gazing exercise. Um, and you talk about progress and having a life made up of, of actions. Well, yeah, you have to do yourself. You have to, like, all these people, they have all these attitudes and all these opinions and all these sorts of things, but they never do anything. Mm. So what's the point? Mm. What's the point of thinking, oh, you know, what's the point of thinking black lives matter if you don't do it? What's mm. the point of thinking um, I'm Australian if you don't do it? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's all these people sit down and do all this stuff or say all this stuff, but nothing comes out of it. Yep. Uh, rule number seven, the 12-step program is a good way to live, honestly, fearlessly examining your life. And in this one, you talk about turning secrets into stories. Yes. What do you mean by that? Oh. oh. Like I said, this woman rang me about wanting to show a film and it was about people in the 12-step movement who were going public with their stories and she couldn't find anyone to show the movie. And um, I said, of course I will. And 100 people turned up. And in all of those 100 people, at the end of the thing, people got up and started to tell their stories. And there was a woman there who got up and she said, I came from a good home. I had a good home, I had money, I had everything. I had the family. And she said, you know, we had everything, she said. And then I got caught up in drugs, she said. And I found myself in a public toilet in the park, shooting up with public toilet water. And I thought, gee whiz, you're brave. That's such shame in all of that. And that started me that 12-step movement where people feel safe enough to say that is holy and it's more holy than being in church banging on about Jesus. Mm. Rule number eight, practice the difference between empathy and sympathy. Yeah. This is where a lot of people get, get, get caught up because you always want to inject yourself into the situation and I've found it's very hard not to but to follow the other person's story mm. so that, um, you know, so often people say, oh, I've had a terrible day and then you say, oh, I've had a worse, you know, and you start whinging, both start whinging. But if you kind of hold yourself back and you say, oh, you've had such a terrible, yes, and you get more and more and more and more. And it actually becomes healing. Mm. And it's, I suddenly realised that's in all the religions. You've got to give yourself away. To find yourself, you've got to give yourself away. Mm. And part of giving yourself away is that, and that's loving compassion. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, rule number nine, don't be afraid of, afraid of the truth. It will set you free. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like so many people live their lives. And you think, you got to be um, me, you know? You think, oh, yeah. And what they never see is um, admitting the reality uh, sets you free from it. Mm. It sets you free. My whole thing is about setting yourself free, mm. setting yourself free, because then you can truly grow as a person. That's something, watching... His holiness a lot, you know. Um, when he walks into an environment, often he doesn't adapt to the environment. The environment adapts to him. Mm. And that's a good way to be. Mm. Um, we've got a couple more to, to run through. I, I, won't, I won't keep you too much longer. It's all right. um, <laughs> realize life is not a self focused thing, realize we are all part of each other. Yes. I do a lot of meditating, a lot, and particularly with breathing, mm. you suddenly realise your your lungs are opening up and the air's coming in. Mm. And as the air is coming in, you're connected to the whole 
air, all the air, mm. everywhere is part. You're you're actually interconnected, you know, and um, we're talking, right? Mm. But where do you end and I start? Mm. Where somehow as we're talking, something in us meets somewhere in the middle, mm. and you think, hey, um, we're not as solid as we think we are, mm. you know. And then you look at the universe and the creation and all of that, like everything ends up a question mark Mm. and we forget that. Mm. And we tend to think we're solid and isolated and rocks, like there's a diamond called Bill inside Bill, Mm. but there ain't. There's just a twisted coil of rope. So that we're all interconnected in this consciousness, whatever it is. And I think it's fascinating that um, something as simple as breathing can unlock that in people. I, I personally do mindfulness exercises every morning, yes. which are very focused on You know on, what I'm talking breathing. about. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you have those moments where you are experiencing a breath and not just having it happen subconsciously, but actually experiencing it. And it's such a it's wonderful awesome. feeling. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so... The, the next rule is uh, you can only discover yourself in the company of others. You can't yes. do it alone. We learn who we are by looking in the eyes of others. So studies have shown that in modern society, people are feeling more and more isolated and more alone than ever, even though we have all of this connectivity. How can people break out of, of that loneliness and combat it? They just go out of their front door and say hello to their neighbours. Mm. It's that simple. Mm. Like 30 years ago, we were finding um, people who had died alone in their room. And I I always remember one place. She'd been dead for days and the smell was... Mm. That's what got people alert to it. And um, um, we're, we're isolated off, all of us, and... Um, We have to break that down. The problem becomes, if we're not careful, we become tribal and then the other tribes become the enemies, Mm. you know. But um, it's it's healthy to be connected. Mm. Living alone on your own um, is just sad. You end up being sad, you know. I I remember somewhere they said... They, they left people in a darkened room um, for a long time and they found all over, they lost, lost an idea of, of themselves and an idea of life and, it, you mm. know, um, we need to be connected, you know. Even, even when people say bugger off, you know, <laughs> that's, it's, it's, it's a connection, you know, and... We're hungry for that connection. And I think um, particularly all the politics that we've got and the governments we've got have um, have cut us off from each other mm. and that's a real problem mm. and yeah. it's sad. Yeah, there's a real um, sense of, I guess, rugged individualism yeah. that comes out of a lot of, uh, you know, policy at the moment. Yeah, yeah, and we can see the result of it is is huge increases in depression, particularly in young people, mm. all of that sort of stuff. And people will start to react against that. And I've noticed, because I do a lot of different things, and I've noticed that young people are starting to get engaged in issues a lot now mm. and they weren't in the past and I think that's part of a reaction against um, this isolationism. Mm. So the last rule um, is the healthier you get, the healthier your, the, your relationships with those around you will be. This is where determination kicks in as you will get blowback from people who don't want change and are being forced to form new relationships with you. You refer to this as kind of a growing pains concept as you grow as a person, grow spiritually. Can you tell us a little more about how you found the determination to push through when you're experiencing uh, these difficulties or these growing pains? It kind of just gra- gradually grows. Mm. 
And the more aware you become, the more aware you become. Um, I think um, we, I started off trying to get better relationships with people in my congregation and then it spread out from that and then it spread to my family and then it spread to... Um, it's just... <sighs> you kind of get to a point and you think, yeah, I want more of that. Mm. I want, you'd know through meditation, mm. you suddenly think, I want more of that. Mm. When, when you Something that's good and something that's healthy, you think, oh, I want more of that, you know? And you suddenly, as, as you start doing that and you start becoming more solid in yourself, like you, it's ironic, you can't be solid in, you can't give yourself away until you're solid in yourself, mm -hmm. you know? And then all those people who saw you as being one way suddenly see you as being another and then they ramp it up because they think i don't want you to be like that i want you to be the bill you were mm. and it then it gets really interesting because it gives them a chance to grow too mm. that's that's what i found it gives them a chance some people don't want to and so you kind of move on a bit mm. you know Reading back on all these rules, to me what uh, stands out are uh, themes around community, honesty and truth. What stands out to you when you look back on, on your rules? I, when I went to King's Cross and I saw all these kids being abused where people thought they were being looked after and all these religious people abusing them too, um, I thought, I don't want to be part of this. And I thought, probably I thought I could change the world. And I thought I just, all I'd have to do is go and see the politicians and stand up and blah, blah, blah. And I found it didn't work. And the only being I can change is me. And also... Um, another big thing was that um, uh, in John's Gospel, in, the, in the, the, the Bible, it says we can only ever be signs. And so I can't change the world, but I can change me, mm. which changes the world for me. Mm. And I can help a kid change, which changes the world for the kid. Um, I think that's hard to hold on to because we all want to change the world. We can't. But I think that's the point for me that what I'm surprised at is the more I've changed me, whatever that means, the more interesting to other people I've become, <laughs> you know, so that... Maybe I can be a sign that the world can be a better place. Mm. So my last question for you today um, is if people were to only take one of these rules and practice them, which one would, would it be for you? Oh, I was thinking about that. Um, and I think it was, don't be afraid of the truth because it'll set you free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent choice. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was a really great conversation, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come and visit us here. Thank you. Um, and uh, you can order 12 Rules for Living a Better Life by Reverend Bill Cruz right now at booktopia.com.au. We really urge you to do so. It's a wonderful book by a wonderful Australian. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia. Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au.